Hello, True Seekers, and thank you for joining us for the second episode of Shell Cavalli Was the Zodiac Killer. Uh, before we get started, first, I want to thank everyone who tuned in to the first episode and anyone who subscribed. And if you're new to the series, uh, we ask that you hit the subscribe button. And this episode, we're going to do things a little bit different. Instead of jumping right into the Zodiac case and talking about how Shell Cavalli was the Zodiac killer, we're going to talk to the man who I developed and as identified, Shell Cavalli, as the Zodiac killer, uh, Mr. Mike Ridelli. Again, he is the author of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, the shocking true identity of the Zodiac killer. And without further ado, uh, Mike, this is your opportunity to tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your personal connection to the case and how it's uh, changed your life for better or worse, I guess we, I could say. It's definitely changed my life, that's for sure. Um, you know, when, when you said there was going to be a question, who is Mike Wardell? I had to think about that and say, who, well, who, who am I really? And really, uh, I'm a guy who always had more education than career direction. Uh, there's a whole world of careers open to every person. They can they can look at you know whatever career they they could possibly imagine. And I looked at those careers, and I could never find one that interested me. None that could, none that fit, huh? <laughs> none none that fit. No. Yeah. So that's how I ended up working as a as a as a contractor as a as an admin at the uh, electronics company and. Really, that's what let me open to uh, to being able to be sucked in by the Zodiac case and uh, and not not permitted to leave. So um, you know, a career is is really a big part of your identity. It's really disabling not to have a career. I mean, when you meet people at a party or out out and about, they say, "What do you do?" And um, you know, people will say, "I'm a lawyer. I'm a doctor. I'm a you know computer programmer." And I had to say that I was a temp worker. I was 42 years old. I had a master's degree and I was a temp worker working in an agency. And, um, you know, it's really kind of kind of embarrassing. That, well, I don't I, I don't think it's in, in embarrassing. That's not to. Well, maybe that's bullet. not the right word, but, you know, it's it's certainly I didn't I didn't have a career that I could call my own. You know, I didn't have any right. real direction in life. And so that's why I was clicking around on the internet looking for for interesting things to to read and that's how i stumbled onto the onto the zodiac case mm -hmm. and um you know once i did one, once i developed cavalli's name through his letter to the editor it, it's almost like i was just going through the motions of life at that point i wasn't really living <laughs> i don't mm -hmm. know how to put it right. um, it's like my it's like all of a sudden my brain clicked on like a, like a computer booting up and you were ag you were activated by something for the right. first time, a, a passion, so to speak. You had yeah, that's the first time I ever developed a real passion for anything in my life. That's that's a good way of putting it. I, I never had a passion for anything. I had, I had tried different careers. I was going to be a teacher. I you know I was in oceanography for a while, but none of none of that really appealed to me. And um, this is the first thing that ever really captured my imagination. And um, I, I felt like the, the, I'm reading a Stephen King book right now called Holly. And, and she talks yeah. about when she got a job and she felt like she was useful for, you know, finally useful to somebody. And uh, that, that's about the way I felt. I felt that I was all the education I had was, was finally useful. And as a, this is uh, me speaking personally, um, the Holly character of Stephen King's, I think is one of his best developed characters that he's had in a book in uh, quite a while, actually. Yeah, yeah, I'm not done with the book. Yet. I'm just about done, but it's a it's a very good book, and uh, you're right. She is a she is a very uh, complex character. Yes. Um, so Cavalli really came to me at a vulnerable time in my life because I, I'd reached sort of a, a bifurcation bifurcation point because at that time I had actually found a career that I thought I was interested in, and I had taken classes in, in advertising copywriting at the, the New School in New York in the, in the maybe 1995 and 96. And I decided that I was going to try to make a go of being an advertising copywriter. And I put together a portfolio. I had it uh, laid out by a professional guy that you know laid out the ads. And I, I, it was all ready to go. And I actually showed it to one company around the time that I developed Cavalli's name. And um, I actually got 
not only an interview, but I almost got the job. I didn't, I didn't get the job, but I almost got it. So I was encouraged. But I got to the point where I, where I had to make a decision between going for a career and, and concentrating on, on uh, inter- investigating Cavalli. And for some reason, I smelled blood in the water. I just thought that I was on the right path. I couldn't explain why, because I didn't have a lot of evidence at the time. I mean, I knew that he was Norwegian. I knew that he, which, which would match some of the Norse references in the letters. Yes. I knew that he had he had strong ties to the UK, which would match those references in the letters. Britishisms, yeah, right. The Britishisms. Um, I knew that he lived near the near the Stein crime scene, that he had a ranch up near uh, Lake Berryessa. So yeah. I knew some things about him. And eventually, I knew a couple of the dates. Uh, you know, the date his mother died was December twentieth. The date his father was born was September twenty seventh. So I knew these things, but I didn't really have all the evidence that I have today. And even back then, uh, I just felt I just smelled blood in the water, and I felt that it was the right thing for me to do to, to pursue, to take my time as opposed to going into a you know a, a career option, to just com- continue working as a as a agency worker, and use my time on the weekends and you know nights or whatever to uh, to explore the possibilities. And what I would do is I would drive into the. There's almost I, I have very fond memories of driving into. Jersey City with my car, parking it on, I think it's Washington Street or Washington Avenue. Uh, this was before, for people that know Jersey City, this was before the uh, the J.P. Morgan Chase. This was when the J.P. Morgan Chase building was just a bunch of piles being driven into the ground. So it was, it was an open lot there. Right. You could park right in front of, now you can't park there, but you could park right there, just walk to the PATH train, take that into the city. I would go to uh, Christopher Street first and then eventually to 33rd Street. and um, then I would walk from 33rd Street up to 42nd Street to Bryant Park, make a right, and head to the library. And it was, I can't, it's hard for me to describe the feeling because every time I went there, I felt like there might be some new discovery. You know, it was, it was very exciting. Uh, it was the most excitement I ever had in my life, actually, uh, thinking about all the evidence that I could find in, in the, just in the San Francisco Chronicle. And when I first started out looking in the Chronicle, I was actually looking for more letters to the editor from Cavalli uh, during that time period so that I could see if he would use unusual phrases like fiddle and fart around or something that Zodiac used. Uh, but what I ended up proving over going through reels and reels of microfilm over like 10 years is the, the exact opposite. Uh, Cavalli, I don't think I ever found another letter to the editor from him for the next, during the sixties. Um, I, maybe I didn't look at every single newspaper in the sixties, but in general, um, like a lot I thought about, I'm sorry. That'd be a lot of print to go through. <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, I had a, you know, you develop a methodology. You, 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 you're looking at one day's letters to the editor. You know, when you turn the dial, it's going to advance a certain amount of time. And then, you know, you're just about right in the right spot for the next day's edit, uh, letters to the editor. So uh, you have to get a feel for what you're doing. And, you know, machine does the work for you. And then you, it advances it just about the right amount. But it was a lot of work because I'd had to put lots of reels of microfilm in, and uh, you know it was it was uh, it was quite a chore. But I went through a lot of years of the '60s, and I never found another letter to the editor from Cavalli. So, and I was always conscious at that time of being sued. You know, I was always afraid of being sued for defamation, and if I ended up in a, in a courtroom with an attorney of his questioning me, and he, you know, I was afraid that he might say, "Oh, you just stumbled onto one of Cavalli's many letters to the editor." Well, I was able to prove that that wasn't the case because. Uh, that letter that we found from that Ed found from June uh, of 1969 was just about the only letter that he wrote to the to the Chronicle during that whole time period. So, um, what I ended up doing was choosing a life. <laughs> it ended up being a life of deprivation that I chose because I think I'm right about who the Zodiac killer was. You know, in a in a way, it was the right choice, even though it's a, it's not an easy life that I chose. Um, it, it was the right thing to do, I think, for me. So you have no regrets on when they came to that fork in the road of saying, I'm going to devote, because I think uh, we want our listeners to understand that this isn't just some fly by night thing. You've been at this as, you know, it's been stated in, in your book, you know, going close to coming upon like 30 years now. Yeah, it's 25, it's 25 years. 25 so, years. So, yeah, it's 25 years. So. I think this year will be 26 years. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I mean, um, you know, I, I mean, there are regrets. I, I regret that I don't 
live a you know great lifestyle. I don't have a lot of money. You know, I don't uh, I don't drive around in fancy cars. Uh, I live in a studio apartment in Atlantic City. So, um, you know, th there are things that I've that I've missed out on because of my decision. But I don't know. There's something about feeling that you solved the Zodiac case that sort of transcends all that, and it makes it you know it when you when you think you have the answer to to a mystery that's eluded people for fifty years. Right. Um, there's something there's something to be said about that. And so now was there any consideration of when you took this on of saying, not only do I want to solve this for myself, but for the victims and of course the families of, of the victims. Well, that was that was the next point I was going to cover. You know, when I first started out, I wanted to solve the the, the case for the victims. It, it had been at that point 30 years and they had no answers, and you know, these poor innocent people were were dead and and they had you know, relatives that were left with no answers. So I did want to solve it for the victims. I think uh, when we see, uh, you know, true crime has exploded uh, once again uh, in the zeitgeist in uh, American, I guess, all over the world. And mm -hmm. a lot of times you see every author says they're solving it for the families and for the victims and stuff like that. But lately there's been a trend of kind of, I think of the Netflix series about Dahmer, there was a little bit of a glorification of the killer that was uh, coming into play. Um, I was just curious, what, what's your opinion on that? Um, is that something that you, you thought about? Well, I don't think that these, I don't think these killers should be glorified. You're right. I mean, the, the thing that gets lost in the, in the, in the sauce that these, these killers become glorified and the victims become forgotten. Yeah. And, um, one thing I've always kept in mind is, um, you know, the, the, these victims that, uh, especially, I don't know, for some reason, the one, the, the one that affected me the most was Lake Herman Road because these were two kids who, whose lives haven't even really started yet, 15 and 16 years old, and on their first date or first official date or whatever you want to say. Yeah. Um, you know, I think they had seen each other during the, they only met the week before, so they couldn't have gone out very many times. And, um, you know, this was allegedly their first official date, and here they are, you know, caught up in this, this crazy serial killer who comes out of nowhere in the, in the dark and, uh, you know, just kills both of them. And, uh, uh, I, I, I tried to make contact with one of Faraday's brothers to try to get him, uh, you know, to read my material and possibly, you know, get behind it. Yeah. And, and I got a sense of just how much the loss was even 30 years later, because this was in the, this was had to be in the, uh, in the early two thousands, maybe 30 something years later. Yeah. The, the guy was still was filled with so much pain that he 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 just couldn't bring himself to cooperate. You know, he he still didn't he, he, like he didn't want to talk to us. As does the, the I mean, he was still probably just the, traumatized by what yeah. he went through yeah. and what he saw. And now, was that the was that at Lake? Bur I'm not. I'm going to say that it. was at Lake Herman. Yeah, that was one. Of, that was one of Faraday's brothers. And he's the one that survived, right? But he was well. No, the, the Faraday's brother wasn't there. No, there were two. There were two victims of Lake Herman Road. They both killed David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. But, okay, so this was the uh, brother. The Faraday of... had younger brothers. Right. Okay, I understand now. But uh, one of them owned a house in Vallejo, and we, I had my Jim, my friend Jim, try to approach him, and he just wasn't uh, amenable to, uh, you know, to reading, to reading any of the material I had on my suspect because. Uh, you know, I thought that he he might be, and if I could get him to get behind my work, to get some of the families behind my work, that might have a little bit more of an impact on the on the police who, uh, you know, well, they didn't seem really anxious to investigate someone as wealthy as my suspect. Let's put it that way. All right. Uh, you know, and, and when I when I first started out back in the the summer of 1999, investigating uh, Cavalli, I remember being being very impatient like I, I i couldn't wait to get more information i couldn't wait to to get to the point where i knew that either, either he was or wasn't the zodiac and um you know i was just impatient for everything to happen i wanted everything to happen Tell yesterday us what's going on in, in, inside you right now sam please i have headache right how long have you had those headaches sir, sam it's been a long time since i killed a kid well was it before December that you had the headaches? Yes. Did, were you in service that you might have had the, an injury in service? Did you ever fall out of a tree or die? You know, the, the problem is that 25 years of my life have gone by. I'm 67. You know, I'm not going to live forever. And, uh, 
you know, I, I, I want to see this case solved and I want to see my, my theory vindicated. And, uh, you know, it, there's just nothing on the horizon right now. Uh, people talk about DNA, but we'll talk about DNA down the road. I won't get into it now, but I don't. Yeah, know that's going to just for our listeners. The, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I said for our listeners, uh, the situation with the DNA in the Zodiac case is going to be an episode all unto itself. And it's going to be interesting uh, to talk about what is holding water when it comes to the DNA in the Zodiac case and what is simply what's being put out there and what is simply false just when it comes to DNA in general, when it comes to its ability to solve crimes. Right. And, and specifically in its ability to solve this crime. Yeah. DNA is a great tool and it's, it's solved a lot of crimes, but I think, uh, you know, people are so obsessed with it that they can't see any shortcomings in it and they can't see any, any limitations to it in the Zodiac case with evidence as old as it is and uh, different aspects of the, of the evidence. Uh, I think that people are just putting too much credence into DNA. Right. But um, um, getting back to the victims, was there any, well, I guess, was there any family members or anyone who knew a victim that you were able to speak to? No, I've never, no. I've never spoken. The only person I've ever spoken to was Dean Farron. And, uh, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't overly helpful. Uh, you know, his, uh, you know, obviously he wasn't at the crime scene, so he doesn't know what happened. And, uh, he seemed to be kind of unaware of what Darlene was, you know, was doing or who was, who, who she was hanging out with. So, um, you know, but that's the only person I could think of that I spoke to. We attempted to speak to one of Faraday's brothers, um, I mean, in terms of witnesses, we spoke to the to the Robbins kids, but that doesn't that's not victims. So, uh, and I tried to approach Brian Hartnell because I had a tape of my suspect speaking, and I wanted him to listen to it. Um, never heard from him, so he just he just uh, tuned me out. So well, I think uh, of the of Hartnell, even in the way that he's portrayed in the movie Zodiac, um, it's a short scene. I don't know if anyone you know he just they have him listen to the audio uh from the guy who called in uh to the t uh to the tv station and he said that's that's not the guy and it's just when you see that brief moment of that character in the movie um you can just see that his life has been destroyed by what he went through at yeah, the, this this was right after you were talking about a scene that happened right after the attack, right? I mean, he was still in the hospital, or still he was still bandaged up, or something. Is that my is my no? It was in the uh, in the movie. They actually brought him in to listen to the audio recording. Oh, okay. it, it, it's a very brief scene, and he's he has a cane, and he has a terrible. Yeah, he has a cane. That's what it was. So he's still showing effects of the uh, of the yes. Of the attack. Yes, and we're talking about you know two thousand. I don't know, maybe. 2007 or eight or six or something like that, where I tried to get him to cooperate. I mean, years later, but, uh, you know, he just wouldn't, uh, he just wouldn't, wouldn't cooperate with me. So, uh, the only, the, the only other person I spoke to, uh, was Michael Bates, uh, Sherry Joe Bates brother. That was years ago. No, uh, but I did, I did get to speak to him and he, he spoke to me, but, um, and what did he have to say? You know, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember now. It was so long ago. It was years ago. It was, it was very, very early in my investigation. And, um, uh, you know, honestly, I don't remember exactly. I, I I know that he, I think that he may have originally picked out the car or something like that. And, you know, I, I know that his fingerprints were apparently found in the, in the engine compartment. So I guess maybe he, he fooled, not, not fooled around, but maybe he tuned up the car or did something with the car, you know, be, uh, while Sherry Joe was driving it, which wouldn't be unusual for a brother to no. mess around with a car. If she's, uh, you know, if she has something that went wrong, but, um, I really, you know, it was such a long time ago that I don't really remember. I'd have to look back on notes that I think I have to find out exactly what he said. But I just remember him talking about the car a little bit. Um, the other thing that, that that upsets me sometimes when I hear it is people, um, like if there's a police officer who becomes interested in the case and never lets it go, you know, he just holds on to the case and and for 25 years, let's say, you know, and he never, he never forgets about it. And he's always thinking about it sure. and he eventually solves it. Let's say they, they call him a bulldog. 
But when you're an amateur investigator and you're still working on a case 25 years later, people look at you and they say, oh, he's obsessed. You know, and I've always found that a little bit disturbing because, uh, you know, I, I've done an investigation that's sort of like a police investigation. I mean, uh, I've had police officers, uh, you know, or detectives who worked on the case. My friend Jim and uh, another detective named Pat Great, who was with the Solano County Sheriff's Office uh, in the early 2000s, uh, you know, really praised the work that I've done. I think Vince Repetto, too, had respect for what I've done. So, you know, I've sort of behaved like a police officer, even though I'm not one or a detective, even though I'm not one. But people, you know, when they, when they look at amateurs who hang on to a case and never let go, they call them obsessed, which is which is more derogatory than to call someone a bulldog. And, um, you know, I just uh, I just don't like the distinction that, that people make there because they make you sound like there's something wrong with you. You know, always obsessed with this case, you know. Well, you know, if you had the evidence that I have, I think you'd probably hold on to. Well, now that we learned a little bit about you, Mike, and your personal relationship uh, to the Zodiac case and Shell Cavalli, I think it would be great if uh, you could kind of, you know, it's been so many years have passed, um, the best that you can, uh, kind of put us in a time machine or a DeLorean for Back to the Future fans out there and uh, take us back to the time period of when, how this man became Chetel Cavalli and how he was such an influential character, but was kind of under the radar uh, in the San Francisco area at that time. Right. Well, we've gone from who is Mike Rodelli to who is Shel Cavalli. So let's talk about him a little bit. Yes. Uh, he was born in Trondheim, Norway on July 17th, 1919. He was the son of a ship captain. Um, his father uh, was stationed, I think, in um, in South America. He, he got a he got a job working for a, uh, with a South American ship, so he, he was away from home a lot of the time. And uh, I believe that he was an alcoholic because when he died, uh, one of the things that was listed on his death certificate was cirrhosis of the liver, mm. and that's usually from alcohol. So, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be surprising to find out someone who spent so much time at sea where it gets boring, you know, there's nothing to do. So I guess you drink. And Vikings, if it's this, we're talking about Norwegians, Vikings can hold their beer. That's what they do. <laughs> That's something that, uh, something that you know. <laughs> um, so uh, the father eventually made his way to, to the West Coast of the United States, and he, he brought the family over. They came to the U.S. in 1929. So Shell was 10 years old when he came to this country. And when you talk about uh, – I think he had a pretty – you know, he only he only spoke Norwegian at the time, so he probably had a very bad Norwegian accent. But I think that over the the amount of time that he was here, from 1929 to 1969, 40 years, I think that he probably had a great opportunity to lose that accent. And when I hear descriptions of the way he spoke, you don't hear anyone saying he had a heavy Norwegian accent. You just have people saying that he had a slow, measured manner of speaking, which is what was described, uh, you know, for for Zodiac at Lake Berryessa. Um, so he was the, let's see, he was one of four brothers. There was uh, Shell, there was Ragnar, there was Knut, and there was Bjorn, and then there was a sister. Mm. So there were five kids all together, and they were very heavy into skiing. And um, he, Ragnar won some championships. He, Ragnar was the older brother. He became an architect who designed, I think, the Sands Hotel in, uh, in Las Vegas. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, he was he was a big time architect, okay. and um, Shell eventually made his way into. I think Shell said that when he when he played with the kids on the block, he wasn't he didn't know anything about baseball, so he wasn't good at baseball. So he would just stand at home plate, and when the guy would hit the ball, he would run for him, and he found out that he was faster than the other kids, and so he uh, became a, a track champion when he went into a high school and then to college he, he won the pacific coast title or something like that on the 100 yard dash in like 1940 or 41 or something like that and i actually went through an online library catalog and found a lot of articles <clears throat> uh this is a uh cavalli this is a guy who was used to already getting his name in the paper a lot because of his high school and collegiate achievements in track and field. Right. But right. he was not some vanilla bland runner. He, no, I think after he graduated from college, he uh, ended up tying unofficially 
there were hand timing races in those days. And, you know, there was some question about what the exact time was, but he unofficially tied the record in the hundred yard dash that was held by Jesse Owens, who won the 1936 Olympics, the Hitler Olympics. So, uh, and congrats to Jesse for really sticking it to those Nazi. (laughs) Right. Um, so Jesse Owens, you know, when you're tying a record held by Jesse Owens, that's, that's no small feat. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think he was going to become the, the, uh, the captain of the track team next year in college, 1941, but he got drafted into the Navy. Uh, he was in the, I don't know if it was the Navy Air Force or what it's called, but the the Air Division of the Navy. And he became a transport pilot during World War II, working out of Oakland, I think. So he was transporting goods and arms and materials and people, I guess, different places. Uh, he was discharged after the war in 1945. And um, now that's interesting. Because obviously there's always been talk of any Zodiac candidate suspect is their knowledge of military, specifically the Navy. Navy. Yeah. Right. Plus the fact that he worked on planes. So he would have been, I think, familiar with the wing walker shoes because those were the, what they used to walk on the wings of planes. So specifically wing walkers would have been something that would have, would have been something that he would have probably been familiar with. And of course, Zodiac apparently wore those at Lake Berryessa. So he was discharged in 45, and he immediately started, a, a, I think it's called Willis, it's pronounced W-I-L-L-Y-S. I used to say Willie's, but I think it's Willis um, dealership in... Um, so already he's spelling things wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just don't know how to pronounce them. Right. Willis. Yeah. Um, so he started that dealership in, um, in the Oakland area in Alameda County. Uh, but he wasn't really thrilled with them. I guess they weren't a really exciting car to sell, and you know he was sort of restless. And he he went to New Orleans in 1946 to see some motor, motorcycles that someone had. And while he was standing on the corner, this car drove by that he had never seen before or anything like it before. It was, it was an MGTC, and it was a British sports car. And he basically said, uh, you know, let me take a ride on that. So the guy gave him a ride, and once he rode on that, he was hooked. Mm-hmm. And so he immediately gave up selling Willis's. And um, started importing MGs and eventually every brand of British car you can imagine, including Rolls Royces, Bentleys. Uh, and the infamous Volkswagen early on. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Jensen Healy's. And then um, a few, that, that was in 1947. So I think 48 was when the first cars came in. And there's, there's, a, there's an article, but the first article about him, ironically, I don't think ironically, I think, uh, you know, significantly was on August 1st. 1948 and of course zodiac asked that his first uh letters the first articles in the chronicle be and the and the, and the examiner and the Palaio times herald also be published on august 1st so i think that this is a this is one of the dates i think that, that ties cavalli into the case this august 1st date um but um he uh he started selling these cars in 1947 he quickly sold started selling a lot of them and um I think by the 1950s, he was a millionaire. And uh, in 1951, he signed a deal with a, with a friend of his to uh, import Volkswagens, which were then known as Hitler's cars. And they were not very popular to be imported because obviously Hitler was associated with them. Hitler had designed them yep. or, or come up with a basic you know, basic design. I don't know they actually designed the engines and everything, but um, you know, he, he came up with the basic design of a Volkswagen. And it wasn't very popular to be selling Hitler's cars, but... Uh, Cavalli did it, and uh, he ended up. I remember one point there was a quote from him saying that he put those put those damn things all over the place. So he sold a lot of uh, a lot of Volkswagens. The the importing and clearly he was he was uh, proud of that fact. Oh yeah, yeah, he was proud of the fact that he sold Volkswagens. He uh, they imported them through Oregon, uh, Portland. I think his brother Canute ran that dealership and that importing business. They imported them through Oregon, then they distributed them to different places from Oregon. So uh, he sold a lot of Volkswagens. And um, by the 19, uh, 1950s, uh, he began, late 1950s, he began racing cars and he eventually built the, his company where he, where he sold the British cars was called British, British Motor Car Distributors, BMCD. And they had a racing department where they hired Joe Huffaker, who was a big race car designer at the time. And they started racing in races such as the Riverside Grand Prix, which eventually became the LA Times Grand Prix down in Riverside, which is associated with the Bates case. Right. Uh, in the early 1960s, I think he started uh, 
he started uh, uh, breeding and owning horses. And uh, he built a, a, a ranch up in Oakville, California. Oakville is about halfway between Napa and Lake Berryessa. So I think that that's another thing that puts him close to a crime scene. Uh, plus, uh, I think in the early 60s, he owned a house on um, Lake Tahoe and he had a speedboat. He was a speed. He, when, when I spoke to him, he said that he was a speed addict, basically. He loved speed. It loved sounds. Fast, his fast cars. Um, this, it sounds like he was what people would refer to as a adrenaline junkie. Yeah, right. I guess that's what that's what you would refer to him as an adrenaline junkie. So, the fact that Lake Berryessa was the speedboat capital of Northern California always interested me with respect to the fact that he had the the ranch up in Oakville, and so I, I feel like he he, he might have. Uh, you know, I never I never was able to prove that he had a boat on Lake Berryessa, but um, certainly that wouldn't have been out of the question because he. Uh, he was a big speedboat enthusiast, and he owned a speedboat on. It was a big speed enthusiast in general, and he owned a speedboat on uh, on Lake Tahoe. So I think it was about 1965 that he bought 3636 Jackson Street in uh, Presidio Heights, and um, he lived there continuously from then and until uh, uh, he passed away in 2013. Uh, in 1970, he bought Jensen Motors, which obviously has the name of one of Zodiac's early victims <laughs> as the name of the company. And they did some interesting oh, wow. things. With... Oh, yeah. 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 You didn't know that, huh? I didn't know. No. Yeah. They bought Jensen Motors. And he did some very interesting things with Jensen Motors with respect to articles and dates and things like that. So we'll, we'll get into that later. Yeah. Um, he also supported Virginia Slim's tennis. Uh, I think that he bought Britannia jeans. Uh, he was an entrepreneur. He, he did all sorts of different things. He got into banking, or I think he took advantage of uh, subprime borrowers. We'll get into that later. <laughs> and uh, he was one of the first horse owners to use a female jockey, Robin Smith, who later married uh, Fred Astaire. Um, and then in 2000, he built the, he bought a plant in Modena, Italy, and he started building the Cavalli Mangusta, um, which didn't really wasn't really a big success, but he he, he designed and built that car you know from scratch, and um, so he was a you know he was during the course of the of this time in San Francisco he became fairly well known. I mean I, I think he didn't become a household name because his name was so difficult. You know people really didn't couldn't embrace it. I guess and yeah, it uh, doesn't roll off the tongue. So yeah. no, it doesn't roll off the tongue at all. In fact, it's you know, virtually impossible when you first read it. It's impossible to, to pronounce it. I mean, I've, I've gotten used to it over the years, but uh, you know, I remember my father used to call him Gajel, <laughs> mm -hmm. which isn't really the way you pronounce shell, but that's the way you read it in English. Um, but he became fairly well known. I mean, he, uh, he he was behind the scenes in a lot of different things. Um, I know he's his wife uh, and he supported the opera. Uh, I don't know that they specifically, I can't specifically say that he, uh, you know, went to a showing of the Mikado, but it wouldn't surprise me. At least if his wife wanted to go, I think he would have accompanied her. Um, and do you want to just real quick for the listeners, the significance of the Mikado? Yeah, well, uh, the Mikado comes up in some of the Zodiac letters in 1970 where uh, he uh, he uses the, uh, I think, the entrance, the entrance area of the uh, Lord High Executioner. Uh, it, plus, there was a Tit Willow reference in 1974 if, if, if Zodiac wrote that letter. Right. So uh, there are there are references to the Mikado in in the Zodiac letters, and uh, you know one of the things people always try to do is tie their suspect to the Mikado. Well, I can tie him to opera, but I can't specifically tie him to the Mikado. Although I can't, you know, it wouldn't wouldn't surprise me at all to find out that he went to see the Mikado. And, and plus, he could have. I mean, the source of him not being interested in the opera was him. You know, when I met with him, so. You know, who knows if he was telling me the truth, because he didn't tell me the truth on a lot of different things at that meeting, as we'll get into later. Yeah, but just <laughs> just so the audience does know, you did meet face to face with uh, Cavalli. <laughs> and to me, that's just I mean, I think that's stunning. Um, yeah, I met with him in 2006, September 2006, and we'll we'll get into the yeah, we'll get it. Yeah, that that's meeting later. But yep. because it was very interesting the way that it was held and the day that was held and yep uh, but for now what, what what's he doing in nine what where is he in his life and 
let's go into the 70s. I, actually, I would want to know uh, his horse racing, about his interest in horses and horse okay. racing. Well, I think that he used to ride horses as a kid. So he became horse, interested in horses as a kid. And um, I guess he decided to make a business out of it. So uh, he owned quite a few big horses. Uh, you know, he never won the Kentucky Derby, but um, he uh, he did win some of the bigger races on the, like the Southern California circuit. Like I think it's at Hollywood Park or something like that. Um, I, ha I don't remember the horses at the, off the top of my head, but I know that he had some some ones that, that ran against big, well-known horses at the time. Um, but he never, he never struck gold with, uh, you know, with, with the Kentucky Derby winner or Breeders' Cup winner. But uh, he did very well. He, he raced mainly on the uh, Northern California circuit at Golden Gate Fields and, and the Bay Meadows. Um, and he did pretty well. I mean, he was very well-known up there. Um, he, uh, he won a lot of races. He made a lot of money. And it was, but it was basically a hobby for him. He was also big into golf too. He was a very, very big golfer, which sort of interests me with respect to Blue Rock Springs because that was right next to a golf course. And in fact, uh, in, the, in in one of the Zodiac letters, he says, uh, you know, I killed him next to the golf course in Vallejo or near the golf course in Vallejo or something like that. So yeah, I don't yeah. bring up golf. Zodiac does bring up golf courses specifically in his letter. So um, you know that that. That aspect sort of interesting, but he was a he played. I know he was to play in the Pe Pebble Beach Pro Am uh, with another with a professional golfer whose name is escaping me right now. But uh, he wasn't the, the, the professional he played with wasn't a big name golfer, but he was a professional golfer. Right. And, uh, I think the important thing to glean off this is that he was in a very exclusive circle. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he played in only he played the, the Olympic Club and the San Francisco I think it's called the San Francisco Golf Club two of the two of the elite golf clubs in the Bay Area so he was a he was definitely um, you know upper crust um, plus he belonged to the Bohemian Club which is a very exclusive club and you know you only almost don't have to say anything more about somebody than to say he's in the Bohemian Club because if you're in that then you're in the upper crust of uh, of San Francisco society of Bay Area society. Um, Actually, an American society. Yeah, just American so people society, know, right, some right. other members of the, you could call it a secret society that, you know, fu functions, you know. Well, I know Nixon. I know Nixon went there. Nixon, Reagan, the Bushes. Yeah, Nixon, Reagan, um, right. So it was a Republican enclave, I guess you could call it. Yeah, that's, yeah. Clarence Thomas belongs to the Bohemian Club. Yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of, a lot of big names and a lot of names that people never heard of, but who are big behind the scenes in business, uh, you know, or very famous businessmen go there. And like I said before, it was started by the media. So, uh, you know, you'd, you'd be intermingling with uh, people from the Chronicle. Um, I'm, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I know that I can prove that Cavalli had, that he would have known Herb Cain and he actually would have known Count Marco too, uh, which came up in the last several months uh, for some very interesting research that someone else did that links him strongly to Count Marco. Hmm. which about whom Zodiac wrote his last letter. So, um, yeah, Cavalli was, you know, he was within, within San Francisco. He was very well known outside of San Francisco. He was very obscure, I think, because of his name. And um, I mean, among people that, that know sports cars, he's very well known, even, even outside of San Francisco, because yeah, of, the because of everything he did, you know, he, he sponsored big races and, he was involved in the um, Sports Car Club of America, uh, organizing races, road races, as they called them, which Zodiac also called them in his letter. Uh, those were those were things that he organized. In fact, there's a big poster that says road race that he organized. And so, uh, of yeah. those races, wasn't one of the races that he supported, uh, wasn't that in the Riverside area? That he was a major sponsor of. Well, he, I don't know if he was a major sponsor, but he had a car entered the weekend that Bates was killed down there. So that would have, that would have given him the reason to be down there that weekend, even if he didn't kill her. Um, it still, can, I can still show that he was down there that weekend, which I think that's more than a lot of people could do for their for their suspects. Another thing that Cavalli did is, and I'm not into racing, but he apparently designed the thing called the Corkscrew at Laguna Seca racetrack, which was. Like a, a new addition to the course that made it more challenging. 
uh, where they had to go down this hill and around this turn or something like that. And he he actually said, why don't you have the cars go down there? And they eventually ended up making this turn, and it's called the corkscrew. Yeah. As so he, someone who has uh, played a lot of Gran Turismo. Oh, okay. That's a, it's a video game. Um, one of the most challenging turns in that game is the corkscrew on Laguna Seca. <laughs> oh, is that right? And yeah. Apparently, Cavalli was the one who came yeah. up with the idea for that. So yeah, it makes sense. It, it was, it was, it's literally, it, it's, it's a, it's a hellish turn. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't I imagine what, what it's like, what it's like to do in real life, but I know just from playing the video game, I lost control of my <laughs> car many times and spun out trying to take that turn. Spun out in the in the corkscrew. Yep, that's interesting. I never I never heard anybody had that kind of even that kind of experience with it. But uh, yeah, so uh, you know, he was a he was a multi. He became very very rich from owning cars. I, I thought he had a few million dollars. You know, when but when he died, I learned how much money he had, and I was like, whoa. You know, I was really up against, uh, you know, a, a heavy hitter. <laughs> what was his net worth? Do you... When he died, I believe his net worth was a hundred million dollars. Yeah. And now the other thing is yeah. that might not sound like a lot to people today because we're in the age of the billionaire. Right. But for him to be a millionaire back in the '60s, that was the equivalent a multi multi millionaire. That is right. the that's the equivalent of being a billionaire today. I mean. Right, and he also owned uh, one of the horses he owned was Silky Sullivan, which was a world famous race horse, and uh, he, he owned it after its racing days. But he used to parade the, the horse around the uh, Golden Gate Field. He was the president of Golden Gate Fields Racetrack, and as the president, he used to bring the horse into the track and uh, you know parade him around the, the grounds, and uh, you know people would swoon <laughs> because so, of Silky Sullivan. So one thing you had mentioned was that the profile of Cavalli as Zodiac is a power seeker. And with being a power seeker comes obviously control. Right. It seems like if there was any entity and of business, uh, the horse horses, uh, the race cars, you know, these different things. Um, can you speak to that? He had to be in control of, of them from like overseeing them and you know hands on all those aspects of, of his I remember hearing over the years that he was a he was a hands on type of a person um you know I think I think that when you're running a big business you have to be because otherwise you know people could take advantage of you uh, your underlings you know so they can they can start pilfering and things like that so I I think that he well I mean I'll have I don't have specific evidence that says he was a control freak but um I mean, I think that when you're in that type of business, uh, you know, I think he had he had input into what the car designs were. Uh, he didn't he didn't tell the guy how to design a car, but um, I think that when he when it came to the Mangusa, I think he did, uh, you know, because that was his creation. So, uh, but I don't have any specific, you know, anecdotes or stories about uh, about control. I do have a story about aloofness, you know, about how okay. aloof he was and. Uh, um there's an, it's an article but that's about his business and it's talk, and the guy just diverts about how he's a very aloof person uh you know doesn't say anything unless uh, he has something to say and uh and he's been that way all of his life it said and aloofness is one of the traits of a uh, of a power sort of killer and where was that article from uh that was either i always get confused road and track or car and driver or one of those from like 1964 i think i have the article laying around somewhere i don't think i have to get it but off the top of my head you know it was like one of those magazines i think it was from 1964 and it was talking about his business you know his car business and all of a sudden it diverted into a discussion of how aloof he was and how distant he distant he was and how he uh, you know this wasn't some new thing that came along with uh, the fact that he was wealthy that he had been that way all of his life that basically basically the person said so and another strange connection is Cavalli does have footprints uh, in New Jersey, specifically at when at the Cherry Hill racetrack when it was around. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He he purchased a horse in 1964. I think it was called the Scoundrel. Uh, he, and at, at the time, it, it caused a tremendous stir because 
he paid half a million dollars for the horse and it was unheard of for someone to pay half a million dollars for a horse in those days. So he was able to get a lot of attention in the newspapers and um, the horse was going to run in the, I think it was called the Cherry Hill Derby for a hundred thousand dollars or something, which was a huge purse in those days. And you know, probably what would that be the equivalent of today? Several million dollars probably. Oh yeah. And um, inflation. <laughs> yeah. With inflation, you could buy a loaf of bread with that. <laughs> yeah. Now you have to, and maybe half a dozen eggs. Right. Maybe, maybe half a dozen eggs. Yeah. And if it's on sale, maybe some bacon. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> you might be able to couple <laughs> right. Might be able to squeeze that in. But uh, the he bought the horse, and it was apparently he apparently got hoodwinked um, on the sale because the horse was apparently lame. I guess when he bought it, but he didn't realize it. And they put the horse into training, and it, it hurt a tendon, and it had to go out of training. And uh, you know, it went to stud. It never never raced again. And this is only a three-year-old horse. It really had no credentials. I don't know why you pay so much money for a horse like that, to be honest. I, guess it, I mean, if you had paid for, like, Kelso or something, uh, you know, which was a big horse in those days, someone that a horse that had a track record. This is a three-year-old that hadn't even won the uh, Kentucky Derby that year. So, uh, you know, with like, a real chance said, to take on a horse like that. But you said just the fact that he paid that much for a horse got oh, his yeah. name in the paper. And it's funny, if you look... There was a lot of coverage of it. Yeah. Uh, the Phil- Philadelphia Inquirer covered it. Obviously, the papers in New Jersey covered it. But papers it's interesting. In San Francisco covered it. But it's interesting to see the dichotomy of the way that the Northeast covered Cavalli versus his, you know, his homestead in San Francisco. Um, he was he was treated like a joke in the Northeast papers. <laughs> oh, really? I yes. Have, I've never read the Northeast papers about him, really. They said they, they just they really just made fun of him. Like they that was like he was a dupe. He was a dupe, yeah. And he was just uh, buying and he was just buying his way in, and he didn't really know what he was doing. Oh, I see what you mean, right? Yeah. Right. He, well, he was trying to buy his way into the big time, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that he saw more potential in the horse for stud, but uh, you know, for five hundred thousand dollars, he was clearly when he wanted to win some purses with him because uh, you're not going to make. That much money in stud. I think the horse's stud fee was like seventy five hundred dollars. So the horse would have to exhaust itself to uh, to make five hundred thousand dollars in stud. So um, you know, plus we wouldn't want to breed to him. He had no real record. I, I was really, yeah, I really didn't understand why he bought that horse for that amount of money. Um, because the horse, like I said, didn't really have a track record. Didn't really have a. It never won anything significant. I don't think. Right. But uh, he, he shelled out, <laughs> so to speak, for it. <laughs> and uh, the guy that uh, Rex Ellsworth, I think, was the guy that sold it to him, and he ended up getting the last laugh. And uh, you know, he he got his five hundred thousand dollars. And Cavalli got a lame horse. <laughs> so, uh, but like Cavalli said at the time, a deal is a deal. I paid for him, and I'm going to keep him. So that's what happened. Mm-hmm. And it didn't make him go broke. That's the whole thing. Is he didn't go broke spending five hundred thousand. It was just like a you know he brushed the brushed the dust off his shoulder and moved on with his life, you know? So he had plenty of money. I don't know how many millions he had in the sixties, but uh, I know he had a hundred million when he died. And I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Um, If you did, please hit the subscribe button and we will be back in a week or so with more evidence, more facts pertaining to Shell Cavalli and the Zodiac case in general. Thank you. Thank you for your time and be safe.